Hi, and welcome to another episode of Spirit's Ways, open talks about spirit. I am very excited for this episode because I had the chance to meet Dr. Stephen Falder, one of the greatest spiritual teachers in Israel, leading Buddhist and mindfulness teachings. Stephen established Tovana Vipassana Center in Israel and is still the leading teacher. We had a fabulous talk about liberation and the path leading to it. We talked about the small events in our life that direct us to awakening. We talked about samadhi and a good enough samadhi. We, we talked about vipassana and the possible fear that accompanies the set-off to this journey. We talked about the difference between vipassana and mindfulness and about doing personal spiritual work as a service to society. I wish us all a pleasant listening that brings brightness and clarity. Okay, shall we start? So I want to suggest that both of us right now drop into this moment in the fullness of this experience right now. And all the people listening as well. That means we open our senses. We feel our body is sitting. We're listening. We're present and deeply at home. So I suggest that you do that now in yourself and be true. And we feel we're at home in a consciousness that is endless, quiet, and super present. And as both of us sort of start with that place, it's like we start by swimming in the ocean. Then we'll deal with language and what the mind produces. But right now, remember the ocean. And I think we have one moment of quiet where we can do that together. And everyone listening to just take this moment and die. When we're under the ocean, in this place of being, of present, it's endless, but we can also watch all the strange fish that we discover there, the thought, and light, the impression, the realization, they're all swimming about in this endless ocean. Okay, you just take it there. We didn't forget it. We're still there, but we give importance to language and form. Thank you for bringing us here to this moment and for having me here. And I, I would like to know actually what brought you in the beginning to deal with the topics you're dealing with today. I think that uh, there's many ways that bring people into the spiritual journey of Shakti. So sometimes it's intense suffering and the challenge of <clears throat> real unpleasant experiences that make you ask the question, why am I suffering and what's all this about? But sometimes it's pure curiosity. And that was my case. Hmm. Well, I remember from a childhood, I was just deeply curious. And one episode that I remember, I used to love reading the Jungle Book by Rudyard Kipling. I had it in a very old edition with a hardback. And Mowgli 
thought he was a wolf because his parents were apparently wolves. So I realized that we only think who we are because our parents tell us who we are. And if we are, our parents are wolves, then we think we're a wolf. Wow. So that means that my parents told me I'm a person, I'm Stephen, I'm like this, I'm like that, meaning I'm nothing. I'm just what I'm told. Therefore, it's the reality. And I was obsessed with that at the age of, I don't know, seven years old. It's all happening by itself. It doesn't have a basis. There's no reality to Stephen. It's just what I happen to be, or happen to be told. And then that carried on really from there. I was very inquiring as a child. I was very, in a way, introspective <clears throat> and lowly also, because all my friends in, in the street were running after football. They were, do I support Arsenal or Spurs? <laughs> and I was just leaving it alone. But I was a bit lonely, uh, very introspective, reading thousands of books. And then um, I got engaged with the hippie period. I went to America, took LSD, uh, hang out with the Grateful Dead in California in 1960, whatever, six. Um, LSD was legal at the time. It wasn't illegal. It's just what people did. Hmm. And uh, that confirmed it. And then later on, um, in 75, I went to India for a year as a teacher in the university at Varanasi. I was there teaching biochemistry to PhD students that had a scientific background. Uh, but I was hanging out next to the Ganges most of the time with the, all the Saudis there. And uh, in a way, then I picked up, I would say, a meditation as a practice not just theoretical spirituality and questions and dreaminess and cla and chasing the rainbow, but really seeing that, wait a minute, I have to learn a serious practice in order to kind of just really undo the block rather than chasing spirituality. So from then on, I was in the Buddhist path, and, and that was like, uh, God knows how many years, 75, 76. In, wow. And what was your gateway to, to really enter this path over there in the Ganges or just meeting someone? Was it inner realization, a person? I don't think there was one gateway. Um, but one other thing happened to me that was very magical. <clears throat> Every morning, I would swim in the Ganges. Nobody... Nobody can understand why I did that mm -hmm. <laughs> with the bodies floating. Yeah, in Varanasi, it wouldn't be that cheerful. <laughs> I decided that's what I wanted to do. Never got ill, by the way. Okay. And then one day I was swimming in the Ganges and I saw a rock over there in the middle of the Ganges. It was the monsoon. It was April, I think, or just before the monsoon. No, just after the beginning of the monsoon. Ganges was full. I swung to this world and I said to myself, I want to know God right now. I want a time, I want a, some visitation. Something has to happen now. Challenge the world to bring me something that's totally confirmed and beyond the ordinary. And at that moment, around 30 dolphins appeared. And they began to swim around this rock. Oh, wow. Around and around. There was there were Gangetic dolphins. They do exist in the Ganges less today, but they were there and at that time many more. And for about an hour, they just swam around oh. this rock. And I was sitting there in sort of total bliss. <laughs> so if you want one event, that's one to remember. But the truth is there wasn't one event. Yeah. Their whole path uh was kind of guiding me in many, many, many small events. And people sometimes ask me now, is there a before and after, be, you know, an awakening event that before you're ordinary and after that you're not ordinary? And it, it's not like that. Many, many daily events. It's like day by day, the veils were dropped or the filters 
in the consciousness were undone. And you see things more clearly, more infinitely. So it was day by day, the filters, and I would say the inhibitions, brain language, if you like, brain cell language, the inhibition were uh, gradually undone. And then I started to, I would say, the um, from the practice point of view, the first event was the um, uh, retreat I did with Goenka, uh, with himself, Goenka mm-hmm. himself in Rajpur, mm-hmm. in, uh, in, in, in India. Ten day meditations, absolute health. <laughs> Those that think through the same experience know it. Uh, 13 hours meditation every day, uh, sitting down one hour each time, body hurting like hell, uh, but it was strong. In what sense? It was strong because uh, it showed me a direct meeting with reality that was not in the territory of interpretation, translation, impression, and all the agency between you and an experience. Mm. So it basically cut the bullshit. Mm. It sort of cut through the processing of things. And I was, but it was very simple. It was mostly the body, the body and the breath. So it was cutting through that. And then also it gave me confidence to know that I could concentrate, that I had samadhi. Not super samadhi, not a kind of a Olympic-style samadhi, <laughs> but should we say good good enough samadhi? Yeah. Afterward. Good enough samadhi, that's great. <laughs> People really worry about that, about samadhi. They say, oh, I don't have concentration, my mind is, is scattered. All you listeners, don't worry. Also, the Buddha said, all you need is good enough samadhi. Wow. And it's enough. And I think we all had it, actually. Nearly everybody. That's a big thing you say, because, you know, a lot of the times people, even even advanced me- people that practice meditation, they worry about getting somewhere still, because it is a practice. You, you need to aim somewhere, and the aim is samadhi. And then still, the good enough samadhi makes it really, really close to everyone. It allows you to actually, I can succeed in this. There's nothing to succeed in. What I do is I do my best, and that's that's the thing already. So I think it's rather special to the Buddhist part, uh, because samadhi as a goal came more from the Hindu, from, um, if you to look at the uh, Patanjali yeah. series, eight, Samadhi is the last one, and, and it's kind of linked with awakening or enlightenment. But samadhi is also the word for deep concentration. So in the Hinduistic spirituality, deep concentration has been linked to awakening. And there's an assumption that you need deep meditative concentration to awaken. And that assumption is challenged by the Buddha. And, and the Buddha said, wait a minute, what are we doing this or we're doing this for to awaken the mind. Awaken the mind needs insight. It doesn't need just super concentration like the yogis who say if you kind of go into a breath for like one hour, then you got it. That also creates a kind of atmosphere of a, of a going to the gym, like meditation is a kind of workout. It can. And a, and a concentration workout. Uh, and if you do a concentration for this time, you're better. And the Buddhist path is much more insight and much more help. And that's why the Buddha said, wait, it, concentration is helpful, but just good enough concentration. Good enough for what? Good enough to open the eyes. Mm. Good enough for insight, clarity, looking inside what's happening. Vipassana, the word vipassana is to look in things. Inside. And that's what we're doing here. We're looking at things differently. We're looking at the reality. And for that, you don't need so much concentration. Helpful, but not so much. Hmm. 
So after you got to Goenka's 10 days and you had this experience, this direct experience of life with, without the veil or all the veils, what happened then? Well, I kept doing more and more. Mm. I was a bit of a Goenka addict. Mm. <laughs> and uh, I had, um, from then on, I think I did about 15, 16 Goenka. Ten... Wow. That's like half a year. Mm. Uh, with a woman called Mother Sayama. And she had a center in England, uh, Oak Tree House, I remember it was called. And I did them with her. And I, I kind of was a bit of a groupie or or addicted to this 10 date. And I made a kind of deal with the, my wife because we I got married meanwhile and we started to have kids. And, um, and then I moved over to Israel in the end of the 70s, beginning of the 80s. And uh, I said to her, okay, you married me and I'm going to be going off three times a year to a 10-day course and you'll have to look after the kids, but that's me, okay? But part of the deal is I won't get a job out of town. I will not go off. I was in university system and I resigned from my job at university hmm. as a teacher at university. I work from home, and that was the day. And I look after the kids, and we'll be here in the nature. I'm still here, um, but I'm going up three times a year. So. Mm. <laughs> with whom? No, when now, when you go? Days? Yeah. Are oh, these days? Um, we're talking now about forty years later. Yeah. So these days. Uh, I basically practice here in this, in my house. The last retreat I did was nine months at home. Wow. I took off nine months. I didn't teach. I didn't have any emails. I was disconnected, but I lived with my grandchildren, my wife, so farming a bit, wow. growing our vegetables, talking to people. I wasn't in any sort of extreme state, but uh, six hours meditation every day. I used to sit every morning from about half past four to half past seven, and in the evening again from five to seven or something like that. And uh, that was my retreat. And it was here at home, and I didn't feel, and still today, I don't feel so much I need to go to a special place with any teacher. Uh, I don't need a teacher um, anymore. I'm, there's a point at which you can say, well, wait a minute. The universe is the teacher. It cannot be yeah. a person. Of course, I love to hear teachers. Yeah. Just full of joy. I listen now to Alan Watt because it's all oh. on YouTube, and he's my first teacher, really. Mm. Uh, and it's a joy to listen, but it's not that I need anyone to tell me how to practice. Yeah. So, can you tell us a little bit about your Israeli actions? What are you doing here in our days and courses or groups? How do you pass this knowledge through? So in the beginning of the 90s, which really long time ago, <laughs> although it's nothing actually. In a way. In a way, it's nothing. There's only time, so it feels like yesterday. But anyway, um, some people in a local town said, we hear you're interested in Buddhism. Would you like to come and teach a class once a week? So I said, okay, I'm not a teacher, but I'm happy to give it a little bit of my... Uh... Was it a big group? 20, 30 people. And they were rather a bit, the sense of, uh, like a kind of um, bo almost bourgeois setting with a table laid with hate. <laughs> and I kept saying to them, look, we're here for something else. <laughs> The Buddha comes to the West. That's how it looks like. Exactly. Yeah. But anyway, um, they were just, you know, really nice crowd. And uh, from then, I um, I decided I wanted to kind of organize retreats here in this house. So I was organizing and I invited teachers. And Christopher Titlis was really one of the first major teachers of mine. Um, he came and taught a retreat in, in here in this place. 
Um, and then from there, I decided I needed to start an organization because I uh, just needed an organization. There wasn't any Buddhist teaching in Israel at all. I think I was the only Buddhist. Although I did hear that Ben Gurion mm -hmm. went to Burma <laughs> and learned something. But going to Burma doesn't make you a Buddhist. No. <laughs> yeah. Absolutely not. Yeah. Don't try this at all. <laughs> if you will go to Burma, it won't <laughs> make you a Buddhist. <laughs> um, and so I started to um, talk about that, the Israel Insight Society then in mid-90s. And at the same time, I began to teach retreats and courses and classes from then. And I'd been teaching from then on until today and teaching a lot. So I teach maybe 12 retreats in the year, 10, 12 retreats in the year until now. And then one day teachings here in Khalil and other places, uh, uh, one day practice. Uh, and online, I teach quite a lot, uh, online groups, online courses. Uh, every week that we go through uh, sometimes quite deep teachings every week. So I'm quite engaged in teaching and engaged in a way in holding in, in holding the Israel Insight Society. And I'm sort of the grandfather role in it um, as a founder and a way the senior teacher. So I'm kind of holding it in that sense. And I'm still there, but at the same time, I feel I'm in the now. I mean, I grow my food. Right. Um, my wife and I, we every day we're in the vegetable garden, sort of planting and digging and collecting. Uh, I have grandchildren go all over the place. Any of them might come at any moment to interrupt us. <laughs> uh, I live an ordinary life in a way. I don't uh, have a sense that going to the vegetable garden is worse or low and teaching Buddhism is high. Yeah. I don't have that distinction. It's one reality. There's unity. The whole thing needs everything. In a way, everything is needing everything else. So, for example, this conversation needs the presence of two people, the words, the brain, the, the, the trees above us, the earth underneath us, the whole awareness that we have of this place. So this takes down from the sense of specialness of the spiritual journey. Um, there isn't a specialness in it. As soon as you start going into that place of specialness, you've got a problem. You're, you're in a way in an ego place. I know loads and loads of spiritual teachers get quite easily trapped in that place and they think, well, I can't do the vegetable garden. Other people should do that. I'm sitting on the stage, you know, giving my teaching. It's not like that. Yeah. You, you, Zen knows it. Taoist knows it. Buddha knows it. The, the, the real teachers know that place. They don't put themselves on a pedestal. But uh, just worth remembering that. For some people, the Vipassana method of actually disconnecting from your normal let's say, Western life for 10 days and just to sit in front of a wall or your thoughts or a video or something for hours can seem a little bit harsh sometimes and even, you know, makes you, makes you really to, to be afraid of it in a way. So what would you say to the Westerner? Like me, actually, you know, I, I, I practice meditation for a long time and I do this in my way, but for me to sit for 10 days like this, it's... I don't know, I would say even frightening for a, for a moment. Yeah, I think it's, uh, first of all, to understand the fear. Uh, the insight would say, meet the fear. Don't necessarily believe it. And don't let necessarily that the fear should have authority on you. Meet the fear, look at it, look and see what the real concern is, not just the imagination. But it doesn't mean that you have to do it and that if you feel and not ready, that voice is fair enough. I'm not ready. But there is something about the spiritual journey that says, go all the way. Take risks. Don't just dip your 
finger in the ocean, but dive in. And if you are ready for that voice, then the fear can be there, but there's many other voices inside that will help you with that. For example, curiosity. Mm -hmm. Thousands and millions of people do it. What are they learning? Maybe I should try it. Or love. Love for yourself, love for the practice, love for spirit. I'll do it for love. Or I'll do it because I'm giving other people a bad time. Yeah. Yeah. I'm a irritable, <laughs> annoying. That's a reason as well. Yeah. yeah. And I and they're telling me to do it. Well, I'm telling myself, wait a minute. As a service to society. <laughs> I'll keep going like that. I'm fighting my partner every day. So she's telling me or he's telling me, go and do it. Yeah. So um, there may be motivations, what I'm saying, that are strong and that the fear, then you acknowledge it, but you don't need to obey it. Yeah. And, um, but just knowing that there is, just like you, if you try and, uh, like my, one of my teachers, I think it's Christopher's uh, image, and um, if you keep taking potatoes off the fire, they never cook. You have to keep your potatoes on the fire till they're cooked. Yeah. So that gives you a sense, okay, if it's 10 days, I'll do 10 days because I want to cook. I want to be cooked. Yeah. And, it gives, and then also there is something about flexibility that if we do something beyond our normal capacity, we begin to have a new view of ourselves, And we begin to feel, yes, I can do this. My first fear is the self. But it's saying, you cannot, you cannot. I'm not going to be ready. I'm not going to listen to that point. I'm going to say, yes, I can be bigger than I think. After sitting 10 days in a meditation and being well fried or cooked or, I don't know, or well released, liberated. So where, where does mindfulness come into this point? Mindfulness is a one aspect of a very big path, and it's huge. Sometimes people say there's like 80,000 different practices in the Buddhist teachings. Um, but it's become the flagship, the leader of all those Buddhist practices when it's arrived in the Western culture. And the Western culture picked up mindfulness as being the most relevant, immediate, and needed. And it says something about Western culture as well, which is that in the West we want something practical. We want something that we can feel uh, does real change to us. It's a bit like another project going to the gym a little bit. It's individual. It's correcting something which is important, which is our tendency to be out and scattered and all over the place. So mindfulness is bringing us back into ourselves. And that is creating a balance that's needed. And people know that. <clears throat> and um, the West is interested in mind. When I was teaching Palestinians, for example, or in sometimes other cultures, the mind aspect is rather minimal, and instead, actually, mindfulness is not so relevant. I used imagery, for example, in other cultures and other cultural settings. So, in the 10 days practice, mindfulness would be about paying close and intimate attention to what is, and the experience direct, without interpretation, and without too much distance between you and the experience, um, direct knowing, not through conceptualization or intellectual stuff, but direct knowing what is going on right now. The opposite of mindfulness or non-mindfulness non would be to be an automatic pilot, to be absent, basically. So mindfulness is similar to presence. Vipassana and mindfulness are very close. It's a slightly different language. Vipassana has become a kind of language that's used for a 10-day retreat, 
It's a bit, little bit like a brand, mm. but actually they're very close. Uh, mindfulness is sati in the Pali language, meaning to remember ourselves, to come back to ourselves, to remember our mind as an ocean and not just as a processing machine like a computer, to remember, in other words, big aspects of us and to remember to be there. It has all that in it. And vipassana is more like insight, what we discover on the way. So 10 days is about mindfulness with some samadhi together to allow us to be mindful. Because if we are scattered, we won't be mi mindful very much. We'll be mindful for a moment and then it will go. And we'll notice something and it will disappear. Hmm. So it kind of needed to support the two that go together. Uh, uh, samadhi, that means concentration and consistency and staying with an experience like the breathing, staying with it, staying inside it is samadhi. And mindfulness is what we discover when we are in that experience. And thank you for listening. I hope you enjoyed Stephen's words, at least as I did. Please stay with us for the next episode with Stephen, where we dive deep into the topics of self-realization and the path of liberation. Until the next time, I wish us that the good spirit will follow us with love and compassion.